Hello, my name is Daryl Markowitz and we're here at the Wareham Forge. What I wanted to do in the start of this series is do you a bit of a, a walkthrough of the shop. Um, the Wareham Forge was established uh, officially in 1992. Um, I started working on um, this layout about 1990 and uh, over the years the shop has been added to and cobbled together in bits and pieces using a lot of fairly scrounged materials on a low budget. This is a professional level shop. It's been my full-time occupation um, here in Wareham since 92 and uh, the type of work that's been done in the shop over the years has included um, uh, small domestic items back at the beginning and uh, using you know, re replicas and reproductions for a number of collections and um, what I would probably class as uh, uh, medium scale architectural projects. So things like garden gates, um, individual railing panels in the 10 to foot range, um, occasionally some work on staircases and, and things like that. Um, so what I wanted to do, at least for this first one, is do a real fast run through of the equipment I have here and how it's laid out. So as we proceed with this, what you're going to see is there's going to be a lot of jumps and cuts. And uh, part of the reason for that is that I'm basically doing this live, um, setting up the camera, walking in a frame. So if my head gets cut off, don't worry too about it too much. Try to listen to my voice primarily. That's going to be the important thing. Good? So um, the main thing to think about when you're setting up your own shop is uh, the working triangle. And that will uh, be the primary uh, pieces of equipment that you need in the shop, which is your anvil, which you can see in the bottom corner of the frame, uh, and the forge in the back here, and then your vise. And these are the three main pieces of equipment that you're going to move between while you're forging. So uh, the forge um, that I've got here, my primary forge, is a coal forge. Um, I learned on coal in a historic setting, and I continue to like coal. Um, although there are certain problems with working with coal, particularly in a more urban or suburban environment, I'm up here in the country, so I don't really have to worry about the, the smoke issues uh, and neighbors. Um, I like coal because of the heat it gives, and um, although I do have propane, a number of propane forges in the shop, um, I tend to use them on a more seasonal basis or for specialized projects. And if I'm doing anything serious, I really like to work in coal. So the traditional way to relate the coal forge and your anvil is to actually set your anvil so the, the horn is pointed towards the forge 90 degrees. And what that allows you to do as a smith is effectively stand here with the anvil in front of you. And then what you'll be able to do is just pull your bar and drop it in, in hammer. Obviously really, really quick. And uh, there's very little lost motion. So as we have all come to see, the faster your bar gets to the hammering, the less time you're wasting, the, the, the less of that heat is being thrown away. Now you'll notice that the forge, the anvil here, is actually set at some distance and offset to that standard 90 degrees arrangement that you would think of as more traditional. Part of the reason for that is that I do a lot of work with structural materials, particularly pipe, and uh, when you're doing that, that involves standing in front of the anvil and moving with your thrust back down the line of the horn. <clears throat> so for that reason, I decided to place the anvil. So it set it about a 15 degree offset to being directly opposite the forge. That allows me to stand at the front and work back down the long axis. Now, what that means from a motion dynamic is that when I've got a bar in the forge, I literally move one forward foot forward and pivot to actually do the work. So I'm actually doing a little bit more physical motion. Um, the time probably isn't all that much different, but it does mean I'm moving around a little bit more. Um, I've got a really, really highly mobile style. We can talk about whether or not the, the equipment determines how you work or you set the equipment based on your work style um, in later episodes. Um, the one problem with having the anvil set as I do here is that there's a limitation right there in distance. You know, if I've got a bar that's any longer than about three feet, 
from the tip to the part I have to hammer on, I'm basically messed up here. I can't get in at it. So what I have to do is I have to take my hot bar, walk around the tip of the anvil, and come back and work here. Now, there's a couple of obvious problems with that. Number one, I'm spending a lot more time moving around. I'm on the, the incorrect, the back side of the anvil, in terms of how the, the shapes are laid out. And most importantly, I'm constantly walking around the edge of that tip. And yes, more than once, I've rammed my thigh into that point. Um, so not ideal. I find in this arrangement, in this particular shop, um, anything that's longer than, oh, maybe about six feet. I just have problems of manipulating it inside of this space. We'll look at why the space is as tight as it is in a minute. The third piece of your important equipment is your post vise. And uh, in this case, what I've got to do when I pull a bar, I take two steps and I'm at the vise. Um, I do a fair amount of, of work on the vise with the metal hot, mainly because I have a number of accessory tools that I use quite commonly that uh, are actually designed to mount in the vise. Um, if you're doing certain kinds of hammering, creating right angles and things, it's really, really handy to have your vise close. So you really want to keep this spacing as small as possible. Um, when I did this layout, I used a trick that's in Jack Andrews' book, Edge of the Anvil, which is um, originally with a dirt floor, is you rake the floor, do a day's work, and then look at your foot pattern in the, in the fresh dirt. Next day, maybe adjust your equipment a little bit, rake it, look at your pattern. And the fewer number of footsteps are on the dirt, the better, the more efficient that layout is. And I went through that process for about a year, tried a bunch of things before I actually permanently mounted my equipment in its final placement. Well, how about the anvil itself? Um, the particular anvil I'm using here is a 225-pound uh, standard London pattern. It is not an anvil that actually has maker's information on it. Um, I'm fairly sure this is an English anvil. It is older. My guess is probably sometime around 1900. Um, and it is a forged anvil with a, a tool steel top and an uh, iron base. Um, again, I like working on a, an older anvil because of the quality I get with this arrangement of the hard top and the softer base. Um, in this particular case, it's mounted on a block of um, 16 by 16 pine. This actually goes down into the ground three feet below floor level for stability. Um, and you, as you can see, the anvil's chained down. Um, how about tools around the anvil itself? Well, I've got this wire basket on the, the base of the tail here. And again, I keep the, the selection of um, hammers, which would be my secondary use hammers, both in terms of uh, shape and size. So I've got um, uh, two each, one at um, 800 grams and one at one kilo of, of um, uh, turn of the century farrier's hammers, um, slightly heavier and more aggressive uh, cross pins, and uh, rounding hammers, again, in two different sizes. Um, my main forging hammer, my favorite tool, um, you've probably already noticed you've got one hammer you want to do all your work with. Um, this is an 800 uh, gram uh, cross peen. Uh, it's a German engineer's hammer from about 1920. Um, and I probably do 70 to 80 percent of my forge work with this one tool. And uh, a little trick, and to tell you the truth, I'm not even sure where I picked this up, is I've got a little sheet metal box on the front side of the anvil. And my hammer just drops down in that box. That keeps it handy, but also off the surface. Um, and I just find that a lot more convenient. Yeah, when I'm in the middle of doing something, I do the deal where I just lay the hammer on top of the anvil so it's ready for me. Um, but as I'm switching around, I find the box really, really handy. As you can see, I just drop it down. Um, the primary hardy tools I use, again, are set um, on a clip at the front. Um, you notice this arrangement down at the bottom here. Um, I do have this rigged up with a, a little um, foot controlled lever uh, that I can set up that sits here. I used to do a lot of hot punching work, uh, decorative, and um, that would allow me to take the bar. In. So we're going to look a little bit closer right now at uh, the forge itself and kind of the way that's, that's set up. 
And um, I've got a, a, a professional level a rectangular firebox in this forge that's mounted on a steel table that's protected by fire brick. Um, this particular forge uses an electric blower, uh, on off switch there. Um, in the past, I've used a light dimmer switch uh, to control the air volume. Um, it's a squirrel cage blower you can hear in the back. And um, I have finer control over the air delivered through a lever that's mounted underneath the switch here. And uh, this actually gives me fairly precise uh, air control. Um, and again, it's just a system I've, I've come to really depend on. The other thing that you may notice here is the way that the tools are laid out around the front of the forge. Um, I personally like to work in a very, very clean, ordered environment. So I've got all my uh, small pliers, um, linesman, needle nose, uh, round tip, um, and then uh, the tongs that I use the most um, are set in the front, and these are all uh, set by size type, size type, size type for the most frequently used sizes. Um, I've got my secondary collection of hammers here. Uh, this is my ball peens and most of my cross peens and straight peens that I don't use all that often, but I still want to have them close to hand if needed. Um, with the slightly more unusual uh, tongs set at the back of the forge. So what I'm going to try to do here is give you a little bit of a magical mystery tour. Um, I'm standing at the far corner of this working space. Um, what you're going to notice right off the get-go is this is a really small room. Um, it will probably run uh, about 12 uh, feet um, in width and about 15 feet long. And uh, we're going from one diagonal to the other here in this view. Of course, the camera is distorting this somewhat because it doesn't take in the whole space. Um, you can see the, uh, the layout here for the forge and the anvil that we've discussed um, earlier. You can see that um, next to the vise, I have a, a small metal topped surface. Um, to tell you the truth, I just found that tabletop in the dump and then built the bench to, to suit around it. I really would suggest that that bench at about two feet deep and about four feet long is a little bit small. Um, one thing that's really, really handy, handy I've got there um, is you can see the chalkboard that's mounted above the vise on that wall. And I find a chalkboard in close proximity to my working space immensely valuable. And it means if I'm trying to figure out a process, I'm having problems, or uh, I've got a specific set of shape generations, I could just draw them on the chalkboard. And it's really, really handy to my work. Um, you're going to have to forgive the glare off that one window. There is only the one window into this space. You notice it's fairly bright. Um, I do have one small accessory uh, flood lamp going in here right now. Um, but the truth is, I use task lighting. In fact, if I turn that accessory light off, you can see it actually doesn't make all that much difference. This was really to light me up. Um, you can see that there's a fair amount of glare comes off that window, but this is not a a dim workspace by any means. But what I've got mounted in the ceiling um, are a number of individual floodlights that aim down on specific locations in the shop. Um, what this combination means is that uh, most of the time um, the light in here is incredibly consistent because there's not a lot of outside windows. The task like means it's not dark in here. It's just consistent. And the important thing about lighting your shop is not so much um, keeping your space dull as keeping it consistent day by day. And that's going to allow you to accurately assess um, temperatures by color. If we pan over to the one side wall, you can see that um, I've got my, my, my slack tub on the floor um, beside the forge again. It's a couple of extra steps to it, but I don't find that inconvenient. It's out of the way. Um, I'm actually using a cut-in-half wine barrel as a slack tub. Um, there's a lot of advantages to this, particularly in an unheated shop. 
um, in the winter time that'll freeze and uh, with a metal uh, barrel what, what the freezing does is it punches the bottom out of it um, with the wood that isn't a problem um, it also means that uh, I don't have a fire problem and uh, you can see fairly close to my work area is a, a small this is an 8 inch um, what's supposed to be a 3 quarter horse um, motor uh, bench grinder um, which is one of those power tools you would want to get fairly early on go over to the other side now admittedly the window is causing a little bit of a problem here and I'll try a bit of a zoom in there for you you can see that what I've got next to my post vise is a, a rack that has all my punches in it and um, again because I'm Mr. Anal retented um, I've got all my punches laid up there by size and type uh, the small ones at the front and they they work from um, the more functional center punches and round punches um, on the far left through to the more decorative types on the on the far right and uh, against the back wall there behind that propane forge you can see is um, where I keep all my various hardy tools um, that propane forge you can see right there that's a two burner home built it's not necessarily the best forge we'll talk about that in detail later on and uh, as we get into the far back corner opposite from where I'm filming from you can see on the floor there um, there's a, a long belt 72 inch uh, by two uh, high-speed belt sander that I use for knife making storage rack for all my uh, bloomery materials I'm going to shift the camera now um, gives you a closer view of where the uh, post vise is mounted one thing I didn't comment on before because it was washed out by that window um, I keep my uh, small uh, parts cabinet um, for things like rivets and washers and that um, right handy at the front where I can get at it above that you can see the handle sticking out from uh, two angle grinders one of which is set up with a zip disc and the other one set up um, for grinding function um, again we'll talk in detail about these tools as, as the series goes on but the best bang for your buck probably is an angle grinder in terms of power tools at the back again behind that two burner propane forge um, you can see the light standing up above the uh, belt the high speed belt sander um, just to give me a added ability to be able to see what the hell I'm doing over in that corner um, the door you can see there actually goes into my clean workshop um, for doing fine work and layout and we may talk about that later um, drill press certainly one of the best um, overall purchases maybe not your first round of things you want to buy um, I would suggest probably angle grinder and then bench grinder then drill press as your third purchase um, this is the one from busy B if it has a problem is that the speeds on it are designed for woodworking I've got to throttle down to the slowest speed it'll go it's really often a little bit too fast for metalworking um, I like the uh, full-size floor model because if I'm doing something like setting rivets in helmets or uh, cauldrons I need to be able to get a fairly large object underneath it you may find that even just a benchtop grinder uh, drill press is more than adequate for you to start with um, extra toolboxes and things like that of course I teach here and um, as well as uh, having a total of six sets for uh, students um, I keep uh, some of my Viking Age um, tools there that you can see the anvil sticking out in that far corner um, is uh, the first um, sander that I bought which is a uh, 8 by uh, 48 belt um, sold by Busy B with a two times speed motor on it um, and another thing I might point out is uh, the door to get out of the shop has been uh, surfaced with a, a piece of sheet metal that again I, I painted black and uh, you can see that I can lay a grid work out on that um, when I'm working on a thing like a gate 
and I can go straight from my layout drawings to uh, translate to a full size and I can kind of um, lay up um, a piece as I'm forging it against the drawing to see if I'm even getting close to the sizes I wanted. Again, not as good maybe as uh, having a, a table with a, with a layout drawing on it, but it certainly helps a fair amount. Um, next to the door there, you can see I've got tucked away one of the two um, cone mandrels I keep here in the shop. Uh, one of these days I'll get the perfect cherry one. Uh, what I've got is a, a single one that comes to the kind of point I would like, and a second one that has about the base size I would like. So welcome to the chaos that's the main production floor here at the shop. Uh, I purchased this building when I decided to move out of Toronto, largely based on the space that we're in right now. Um, my building here is uh, converted from what originally was the drive shed, the horse barn, for the church next door. And it was built in uh, the late 1930s. Um, it's an eight foot high concrete wall with a pole frame on top of it. And the interior space here is uh, 40 feet wide by about 45 feet long. And um, the outside of the building actually is 60 feet long. So that back wall you can see there with all that stuff piled up on it. There's another 20 feet of building there, which is essentially the equivalent of a two story frame house, about 1800 feet of uh, living space. And I've got approximately 1,600 uh, square feet here in the shop. So the room we were looking at um, uh, is set up in one third of um, this total space. And uh, my clean workshop is at the back, and then the front um, uh, half of it is boxed in to create that little forge room we were examining. And uh, the central space here is 20, 25 feet wide, um, and like I said, about 40, 45 feet long. Um, so this space does contain some of the major um, power-assisted tools, um, the more industrial tools, um, but it gets set up as need. Um, what you can see in here right now is, uh, and we'll do a pan through to get this all clear. I've got my uh, metal cutting band saw here. It needs to be set up so that I can put long rods in it. And um, I've got a secondary anvil, another 225 pounder, um, that's set up here. This particular uh, wooden block actually doesn't isn't mounted into the floor, um, but it's got several struts on it with uh, metal pegs that drive down to keep this stable. So if I'm working in here, this gives me the ability to work on larger pieces. I think the largest object I've ever forged here, this single piece of bar, was 15 feet long. And I've certainly forged 10 foot long pieces in here on a number of occasions. Um, this space gives me the ability to work on those larger things. Um, we'll take a look at the, the upper part of the, the roof as well in a minute. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is, after looking at this rough layout, um, I'm going to focus in on the individual pieces of equipment. Move the camera a little bit so you can see that stuff. All right, so what we're doing is we're starting kind of in the middle of the room, and I'm going to do a sweep around. You can see that uh, second large anvil I mentioned to you. Um, in its corner. Beside that, yeah, semi-permanently placed, um, is a three-burner um, architectural style forge. Um, again, we'll talk about these equipment in detail, but it's set up so I can pass through really long rods. I was mentioning working on 15-foot long pieces. That's where that gets done. But um, that particular piece of, piece of equipment is on wheels, so I can move it around inside the shop here. Um, in the back corner opposite my forge, you can see the uh, almost completed setup for my partner Kelly Proven Smith, who's also an up and coming blacksmith of her own right. And we thought she should have her own permanent set of equipment. We haven't put the doors on the front of that yet. It's a similar size space, about 15 by 15. What we have there is a 30 ton hydraulic press. Um, this is adapted from a uh, log splitter. And uh, so far that's primarily been used to work with bloomery materials. Um, next to it in front of that window that's washing out your image, um, an oxy acetylene oxypropane torch system uh, used for spot heating and cutting. 
Again, it's on a rack so I can move it around. And uh, small metal top table, which I find really, really handy for uh, attaching metal to while I'm cutting. Um, there's a window through the main uh, large sliding door, and you can see the entrance into the shop there from the outside. Um, tucked in next to the door and the fuse box, um, that's where I keep my on-demand supply of coal, uh, typically six to eight bags. Um, in the corner there, you can see um, my large industrial size compressor and uh, a David Robertson uh, built air hammer. Um, that's a 75 pound throw hammer. Um, a really, really great piece of equipment. So I shifted the image here a little bit. So I'm standing in front of the hydraulic press now. And again, you can see the compressor um, and the uh, air hammer. Um, I, I had a 50 pound, in fact, it was one of the first builds David ever did. And uh, that smaller hammer was actually set up in the corner in the forge room. Um, the new hammer is significantly heavier, about twice as heavy. Um, and uh, we made no attempt to try to move it into the forge room itself. We just left it out on the main floor. A floor. little bit inconvenient when you're trying to move uh, smaller bars from the forge over towards it, but there's just a space problem here. You can see the, uh, the large door that goes into the forge room proper. And uh, my main steel rack, I have two uh, racks, one in the roof of the forge room, um, for pieces in the six foot length range. And so I keep most of my stock. And um, what you see there are um, larger otter sizes, typically um, eight to 10 foots. I personally like to keep a large supply of steel on hand so I can work as inspiration takes me. Um, you can see at the front there, um, a wire brush on a motor. And uh, one of the uh, smaller anvils, that particular one's a 180 pound uh, 1860s mouse hole um, that I use for teaching. And uh, tucked in behind that, it doesn't show too well as the bandsaw I mentioned. Um, that's mainly personal storage on the one side. And moving towards the back, you can see the uh, large elk arc welder. Um, that's the uh, equivalent of a, a, a miller. Um, it's way more welder than I really needed, but I got a really good price on it. And uh, unfortunately covered up with tarps and other working projects right now is a four by eight um, heavy steel layout table. That's a, a piece of a three eighths plate um, on a really, really secure frame. That thing weighs about a thousand pounds. Um, I can actually do a layout drawing on that table and actually forge right on the table to make adjustments. I've got a small um, uh, workmate mounted uh, post vise in the front here. Again, maybe not the best because it does jiggle around a little bit, um, but it does offer me the ability to move back and forth. And then uh, the obligatory uh, woodworking tools tucked in here as well. Um, this space you're looking at right now is where I would normally set up if I have multiple students. And my standard is to, to set up uh, two anvils in the forge room using coal and uh, two uh, people out here on the production floor. Now to give you an idea about this space, I'm going to pan up here. And you can see the main support beam that helps hold the whole building together. That's set about uh, 10 feet off the ground. And there's the roof way up there. I got about 20 feet of clear space. So one of my problems is, how do I possibly heat this space? It's great to have this room. I mentioned making that really, really big circular staircase. I was able to do, able to do the dry layout of that entire unit in here. Um, I set the base on a pallet, and I had no problem putting that whole thing in. But it does mean heat is not going to happen in this space. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea about how the equipment's set up here. Uh, this area we're in right now still has a dirt floor. It, sure, it's a little rough and rugged. Um, you don't necessarily have to have the perfect shot. You're better off to get your basic equipment installed and get working. 
Um, it's always valuable to all of us to see how other people have chosen to set up their equipment, what things they, they consider the most important. And as time goes on, what I'm hoping to be able to do is talk about each one of these individual pieces of equipment in more detail.